Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Melanie McNair. I'm the Senior Director of Public Programming here at the Center for Fiction. Uh, it's so great to see all of you here tonight. How many of you are joining us for the first time tonight? Oh my goodness, you are also welcome. Uh, this is our second uh, really fun Brazilian event with uh, New Directions and the Consulate General of Brazil. So sign up for our mailing list so you don't mix the next one, because it could happen. Um, we're the only literary nonprofit that focuses on the creation and enjoyment of fiction. And tonight's event is part of our On Translation series, which is one of two event series that focuses on works in translation. The other one is our International Library series that takes place at lunchtime here, so that we can also have live audiences joining us from Paris and San Francisco. So check that out, too. <sighs> out of breath. Um, we, uh, let's see, the cafe, well, we've got a reception, as you saw, that's going to happen after this event, so please stick around and buy copies of Clarice Lispector books and talk to the panelists and the actors afterwards. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, I'm going to keep this very short because we have a host of good things ahead of us. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to our cultural partner from the Consulate Gen General of Brazil, Tiago. Good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to thank you very much for coming here to get to know a bit more about the works of Clarice Lispector, who is so important to us as Brazilians. And I would also like to thank New Directions for publishing Clarice Lispector in English and republishing new translations, and also to Center for Fiction for hosting a Brazilian themed event once more, and for, of course, for the panelists. And lastly, but not least, for the uh, group.br. Uh, that uh, when people from, from New Directions told us that the, they were bringing this event about Clarice, we said, oh, let's give a Brazilian twist. And then we invited a, a, a drama company, a theater company, the only Brazilian theater company based in New York, called Group.br. They are specialists in Clarice Lispector's works. They have played uh, several works, uh, Passion According to GH. Well, anyway, uh, others, uh, that which became Passion According to Janair, and they have just uh, completed 12 years <clears throat> last week. <clears throat> so it's, uh, we are very happy that we could uh, blend uh, actual a li a discussion about literature with a little bit of theater, a little bit of drama to make this evening more organic, more fun, and uh, more Brazilian in the end. <laughs> so enjoy the night. Thank you. <laughs> See you later. How can I help you, sir? So how can I help you? I was looking. That I know. I already had something to drink. Martin had a quality whose benefits he didn't enjoy because that quality was he himself. Quality which, in certain favorable circumstances, few women could resist. That of innocence. Which would provoke a certain corrupt covetousness in a woman who is always so maternal and like pure things. Protecting innocence, women were ogres. The woman on the porch looked at him with great chilliness. That you had some water to drink, I also know. 
in some way, everything that was ever going to happen to that woman was already happening in that instant. Well, farewell. What is it that you want? I was looking for work. Is there any work here? No. The garden needs help. Are you a gardener, sir? No. Who sent you? Nobody. What do you know how to do? Pretty much everything. I'm asking your profession. Ah. Well? I'm an engineer. You are an engineer? That's what I said. I don't have any work for an engineer. I can do anything. I have a well that needs to be finished. I can fix wells. The stable is collapsing. I saw. Sometimes I wish someone would hunt a few sidiemas. I can shoot. I also need a few stones placed nicely in the stream to give the water some more power. That can be done. But you're an engineer. That's no use to me. Wait. I don't pay much. But you provide room and board. I do. It's a deal. I am the one who will say if it's a deal. Where are you from? Are you? A bad accent. <laughs> Besides being an engineer, what other work have you done? I can do anything. Hmm. But you have already built wells. Yes. You're no use to me. Only if you sleep in the woodshed. And may I ask you, may I at least know what an engineer is doing in these parts of the woods? Looking for work. <laughs> Wipe your feet before you come inside. Only when Victoria went back to the cornfield did Ermelinda have the chance to turn up with a basket of food for a picnic in the woodshed. The girl was the type who allows without getting offended a man to wander off, which he did naturally as if they were married. The girl had a smell of box of face powder that was making him a bit nauseated. Don't you want to take a bath? <laughs> because I, I can't stand that smell. But it's powder. I know, but I can't stand it. Fine. And she never again smelled a powder. Do you believe in the other life? No, I don't. Silly. Mm -hmm. Since in intimacy, people were used to insulting each other, <laughs> insulting each other would be an intimacy. And that way, they felt quite nice together. Too cowardly to be able to stand love alone. They had already, with a certain haste, moved beyond it, entering into familiarity and losing with the relief the greater size of things. Did you ever? Um, like another woman as much? She sought me out? Not because I was I, or she was she, but she sought me out with the laziness she had. She was very lazy. That she would interrupt me to say she'd gone to the dentist. She was always asking me what time it was. Every once in a while, she'd say to me, what time is it? Oh, I'm so lazy. I'm so lazy. All I want is to be happy, but not to have to do all this work to make myself happy. 
I'm such a different kind of person, very lazy, but wanting things. <laughs> what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Nothing. No. I was wanting a thing, so to speak, forever. Well, that's absurd. Yeah, right. That's absurd. Was she pretty? I don't know. I, I don't know. We haven't seen each other for such a long time. We once spoke to each other directly, as if we only had souls. What time is it? She'd ask me. She'd say to me, what time is it? I went to the dentist today. That's what she would say to me. Today, I went to the dentist. It's been such a long time so into the dentist. <laughs> Thank God I have good teeth. It's actually quite nice when I go because I take advantage of it and spend a, uh, spend a few days in the villa and I take advantage to go shopping, I go to the movies. Oh, I miss the movies so much. She had good teeth too. Well, I didn't mean she didn't. I'm talking exclusively about myself because after all, I don't even know who she is. Imagine a person who needed an act of violence. An act that made people reject him because he simply didn't have the courage to reject himself. A cowardly person, maybe? Um, lie down. There's no danger in me telling you because I'm telling you what I am. And nobody can denounce what other people are. Nobody can even make a mental use of what other people are. After I'm done speaking, you'll know even less about me. That's always how it goes. When we reveal ourselves, other people start to unknow us. What? He then realized that he said too much to the point of getting her interested. Hmm. And glanced at her quickly, but either she hadn't heard him or wasn't interested. Why do you take so many tranquilizers? Oh. It's like this. Um, imagine a person is screaming, and then the other person puts a pillow in the other person's mouth as not to hear the scream. So when I take the tranquilizers, I don't hear my screams. I know I'm screaming, but I don't hear it. That's how it is. I love you. Yes. <laughs> Both sat quietly for an instant, waiting for the echo of what she said to die. Then, since she'd bent over for a moment, some apple peelings fell from her blouse. Without interrupting her chattering, she saw him with the peelings in his hand and said, oh, that perfume is so expensive. But the peelings are already withered. They are? Oh, just look at that. I'll put some new ones in today. What is it that you liked about me? Oh, I just don't know. It's, it started with a kind of curiosity and then it went on and on. And then when I saw it wasn't curiosity, it wasn't anything else. It was you and I. But what did you like about me? Um, I had a kind of awful fascination with what you are. I don't know exactly what you are, but I'm so fascinated because of that. It happened little by little in a short amount of time. I can't tell you what I like about you. I can't separate you into parts. I think that I feel that you are like a whole person. But how did it happen that you like me? I don't know. Certain things, little things, I don't know. Like little things I don't even remember. If I fall in love again, I'll take notes every day about what I felt so I can report back later. 
oh, but I'm sure that when I look at my notes, all I have, it's a handful of dust. Since a handful of dust was what she was having now, and what the girl now had was a past full of so much disappointment that it had made her ironic. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Is this working? Hello? Hello, hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Welcome everyone. Obrigado, Grupo BR. Excellent work. Um, my name is Lucas Uerico Lozada. I'm so delighted to be here with John Keane and Rivka Galchen to talk about Clarice Lispector. Uh, the Apple in the Dark is the book we're going to be talking about today. It came out in 1961. Uh, with the publication of this new translation by Benjamin Moser, New Directions is now completing its project to reintroduce Anglophone readers to the Spectre's work. Um, we were just at a, having a drink with Barbara Epler, the head of New Directions, before this. And they've done so many translations of the Spectre over so many years that we couldn't quite figure out <laughs> how many it's been. Um, but this current iteration stretches back at least to 2011, 2012. Um, includes at least 12 volumes that I can count and nine translators. Um, so it's as ambitious a publishing project, I think, as I've ever heard of, and pretty exciting stuff. Um, so in just a few minutes, I'm going to um, be asking our panelists to discuss the book. But before we do that, I'm going to introduce them and then offer just a very quick overview of the book. Um, so Rivka is a novelist and staff writer for The New Yorker. She's the author of five books, short story collection, American Innovations, the children's novel, Rat Rule 79, which I really want to read. Uh, the novels, Atmospheric Disturbances, and Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch, and the essay collection, Little Labors. Thanks. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Okay. Um, and the essay collection, Little Labors, which is uh, published by New Directions. She has received numerous uh, prizes and fellowships, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, Ronan Jaffe Fellowship, the Berlin Prize, the William J. Soroyan International Prize in Fiction, and her work has been widely anthologized. In 2010, she was named to the New Yorker's list of 20 writers under 40. Galchen also holds an MD from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, which is amazing. Um, that's Rivka. John Keane is the author, co-author, and translator of numerous books, including Annotations and Counter Narratives, both of which are published by New Directions. Counter Narratives received an American Book Award, a Lannan Literary Award, a Republic of Consciousness Prize, and a Wyndham Campbell Prize for Fiction. His most recent publication, Punk's New and Selected Poems, received the 2022 National Book Award for Poetry, the Tom Gunn Award from the Publishing Triangle, and a 2022 Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry. A 2018 MacArthur Fellow, he is a distinguished professor and serves as department chair at Rutgers University Newark. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests. All right. All right, so I'm going to start just by talking a little bit about The Apple in the Dark and kind of where it fits within Clarice's uh, life work, uh, and then we'll turn to our discussion. Um, so in 1961, Clarice Lispector's life was at a turning point. After nearly two decades spent living abroad, she had separated from her husband, who was a diplomat, and returned to Rio de Janeiro, the city of her youth. At age 23, she had burst onto the Brazilian literary scene with the novel Perto do Coração Selvagem, Near to the Wild Heart, which the poet Ivan Ledo called the greatest novel a woman has ever written in the Portuguese language. And while she'd followed this up with Olustri, The Chandelier, in, 18, in 1946, and A Cidade Sitiada, The Besieged City, in 1949, the foreignness of her name and her mysterious absence from the country led some to think that Clarice Lispector was a pseudonym. 
Indeed, Clarice, as she is universally known in Brazil, was born Chaya Lispector in Western Ukraine to Jewish refugees fleeing the pogroms that ravaged Eastern Europe during the Russian Civil War. The family eventually made its way to Northeastern Brazil, where her mother died when Clarice was 10. Her father moved the family to Rio and died when she was just 20. Clarice returned to a Rio that had largely forgotten her. She'd finished the apple in the dark in 1956 in the living room of the house she and her growing family had rented in Chevy Chase, Maryland. For a time, it seemed as though the book would never come out. Then, on the heels of a short story collection published in 1960, the novel was finally released. Its publication proved that Clarice was one of Brazil's major writers. Between 1964 and her death from ovarian cancer in 1977, she then published a string of extraordinary novels, short stories, children's books, and cronicas, all of which have now been translated into English by New Directions. The Apple in the Dark, Lispector's fourth and longest novel, follows a man in Marchim in the aftermath of a mysterious crime. Wandering a landscape in the heart of Brazil, devoid of other humans, he struggles to make sense of himself and the world around him. Finally, exhausted, as we've just seen, he wanders onto a blasted farm owned by a woman named Vitoria and her nervous cousin, Ermelinda. On the farm, Martim's presence leads to a series of baffling encounters with the cousins and their servants. Each character sifts through their feelings of suspicion, determination, love, and joy, as though they were considering each one for the first time. At the heart of these investigations is the question of what it means to know anything, how one feels about one's wife, say, or what one really knows about one's own past. So I want to start by asking the two of you to describe your relationship um, to the Spectre's work generally. Like, when did you first encounter her? Do you remember what the experience is like? Um, Rivka, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I, I do remember it very vividly. It's actually like one of those moments where I think, oh, this is why people go to college. So I was 19 <laughs> years old. <laughs> um, I, was, I was unusually in a sense about sort of um, art and literature and there were, I, I was unusually poorly read or like read in a sort of um, in a sort of narrow way and I took a kind of astonishing class um, with this uh, with James Irby who had translated Borges and done um, a lot of work and and we read uh, Silvino Campo and we read Clarice Lispector and it just hit me as I know it hit John in a certain way it was it was just astonishing. I became obsessed with it. And it, and it was, it's a thin book. It's a book that you read more than once. It's a book that's sort of, on the one hand, in her work, quite clear, quite accessible, and yet, like, wonderfully opaque. It was making me think of that moment in the performance where he said, you know, the more I reveal, the more I'm unknown. So it has that, that kind of really magnetic quality. So that was my first encounter with her. Great. John, what about you? So it was, I think, the same book, but it was in a different translation. Uh, by the original translation, the original translation, I think, was by Giovanni Pontiero. And I just want to say, uh, this version is beautifully translated. Uh, the Hour of the Star. It's it's a remarkable book. Um, I was interested in Brazilian literature. I, I think was going in the library and trying to figure out who had been translated. Uh, I think. Uh, New Directions also has published work by Mario Andrade, so he was one of the people that you know, I encountered. And I saw this book, The Hour of the Star. I said, the name was fascinating. I started reading it, and of course, I was interested in the northeast of Brazil, and the, one of the protagonists mm -hmm. of the book, Macabea, is from the northeast of Brazil. But of course, I had no idea where this book was going to go, and then I will just say, if you have never read this book, <laughs> Lispector does this fascinating thing that's very self-reflexive, and you learn that there's a, you, the narrator starts to speak. You know, how do you go essay? I, I had never read anything like this. I was like, who is this person? <laughs> oh, my God. This is one of the most original books I've ever read. And it, it, it cast a spell. And, of course, I think there was a movie made uh, of it, and I was trying to find the movie, and I said, I have to read more work by her. And I think since that time, I was probably in my, my uh, early 20s, um, I have been utterly fascinated by her and I feel like she never disappoints you hmm. because even when you read her work if you, if you read this book or you read of course uh, Apple in the Dark or any of her books when you reread them it's like you have that prior experience but it's almost like you're always finding something new hmm. because the language is so rich and complex and you know there's a there's a strangeness to it that that 
that doesn't die down. That's great, thank you. Um, the critic Michael Wood once said of the Spectre that um, she is not the Latin American cousin of anyone, even of other Latin Americans. So I'm curious, like, where do you, where do you put her on your bookshelves? Where does she, where does, where does Clarice live? I'm not very inventive. She lives next to next to Machado de Assis, and she, okay. I, I, li I like to put things in languages, but, um, but the whole, the whole pleasure, although I'm, I'm not able, like John is, to read it in Portuguese, is that like. It's so estranged, and you really do feel that kind of. Um, it's all. I feel like her background, um, her her parents' experience in the pogroms, her own Jewishness. All these things were completely um, kind of transmogrified into into something else, and you always feel that kind of wonderful strangeness because of that because everything's sort of gone through, gone gone through some process of transformation before it even showed up on the page. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Um, I, she's, <laughs> I was looking for these books. I was like, OK, alphabetically. Yeah. Can everyone <laughs> see John's stack, by the way? Yeah, I have a little it's stack here. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> alphabetically, oh, sorry, uh, Impreparing. L. Um, <laughs> So she's right. So she's with, she's with uh, you know uh, the uh, other authors. I have a class under L. But I think yeah, I, I feel like um, <laughs> you know, as as Rivka's saying, right? You know, she tra like her experience. She transmuted every aspect of her ex experience, right? But the, but she didn't smooth it down, right? And this is something that comes through in the language, in the Portuguese. And one of the reasons I think these translations, the new translations, are so important is that each of these translators, and they all deserve to be applauded, um, work very hard, but very artfully, to capture the contours of Portuguese and to bring it into English, right? So that in English, you know, I think, probably because of the tradition, particularly of American uh, poetry and fiction, right? We're, we're used to experimental writing. We're used mm -hmm. to people, you know, playing with language. Um, and, and I feel like these translators really capture a lot of that so they don't smooth her edges down, right? Um, but yes, I, in addition, I, you know, being a woman, um, being of a certain class, right? Always feeling like an outsider, uh, always being thought, you know, uh, to not be Brazilian in a sense, right? Yeah. But to have captured something so, or so many things that are so essentially Brazilian. Mm -hmm. I, I think this all comes through uh, in her work. And so she, 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 stands, she stands apart, but she stands uh, with uh, her, her with people of her cohort. Yeah. So I'm curious to know, I mean, I have two amazing writers here. Um, her work isn't easy <laughs> by any means. Um, and many critics regard The Apple in the Dark in particular uh, to be sort of particularly tough. Um, but from, you know, the syntax, the metaphysical questions. Um, so Rivka, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about like how you read her and then what that reading does for you in your own writing. Um, I do want to say that I think Hour of the Star is easy. <laughs> um, so, and I think just like John and I entered into her work that way, it, it has the sort of intensity, almost like melodrama, the mm -hmm. level of kind of emotion that in a wonderful way you think, oh, that's like almost tacky mm -hmm. in, it is, and, in that it goes so far that it becomes kind of magnificent and different. And um, so Hour of the Star is easy, <laughs> I think, <laughs> in a certain way. Just. Uh, but I often think about um, her work in terms of different kinds of music. Like, she's rarely a ballad writer. She's often a kind of Steve Reich ambient experimental music. And, and, and I guess that's what you have to, in my mind, that's like something I start to enjoy. Some, uh, a thought that often crosses my mind with her um, is I remember somewhere Nabokov said, like, I envy painters because all of the, all of the visual information comes, in, comes at you in the same moment of time. Um, and, you know, even in the little bit that we saw here, that it's a preoccupation of hers, this idea that, like, in this moment, in this conversation, everything that would happen and did happen is sort of present. Mm. And so there's something um, about some of her, quote, unquote, more difficult work, like Besieged City, like The Green Apple, that's, um, it's almost like you, it's almost like a painting that's been kind of spread out in time. Like, it, it, you kind of want to perceive it all at once. It's a different kind of music. John, what do you think? How does the, how do, how do you, what does the difference in her prose kind of offer you? And I mean, 
you write poetry, you write, you, you, you very much tackle many different forms in your own work. So I wonder how that, how it feeds your writing, if at all. Well, I would say she is one of the, the authors who shows you how you can create drama solely through language, mm. right? So she, the apple in the dark could have been by many, in the hands of many writers, right? I won't say most of many writers. <laughs> it would have been, you know, like a, a kind of a thriller or a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. right? And she takes the, the sort of the bare bones of that and expands it into this profound existential and metaphysical experiences, metaphysical quest, right? We actually get this character, Marching, right, who she also refers to as the man. There's a kind of dialectical process back and forth, right, where she is stripping him down to his bare essence. And in fact, there, there's, you know, sort of leading up to the point where he gets to the farm, right, he's almost without language. Yeah. And yet there is this excrescence of language, right, which is extraordinary. Yeah. And so you feel the drama, this, it, it's, it's constantly building. And I think, how is it that she does this? And part of it is because she really knew what she was doing, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's on one hand, of course, it may seem like, you know, um, it's difficult. On the other hand, there's a kind of exci excitement that builds as you're reading it, because you're trying to figure out, okay, where is she going? Where is this taking me? Mm -hmm. What is happening in this moment? And all of these things are happening at the same time. And of course, there is just, the, you know, the very uh, excitement of the narration and the language itself, right? Um, I think we, we talked about this. I just want to just say this, just to give one little example. Is that okay? Right. Oh, please. Let's see if I can get to Just as you can hear this, Richardia was a woman as powerful as if she'd one day found a key whose door it's true. Okay, listen. So, you know, usually, you know. <laughs> Professor Keen. I right. like this. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not to turn into the professor, right? The teacher. But I mean, you just listen, listen to the excitement. Okay. Victoria was a woman as powerful as if she'd one day found a key whose door it's true had been lost years before. And listen, you can even hear the music in English, right? Yeah. Okay. But when she needed to, she could place herself instantly in touch with her former power without even naming it. She inside herself would call a key everything she knew. She no longer wondered about the things she'd once known so well, but she lived off of it. I mean, just even that, you know, it's just like, she, you know, she... It, it could have been, again, smoothed down yeah. to kind of say, oh, this is who Vittoria is. But there is a kind of drama even in the opening of this introduction of who Vittoria is. And she does this again and again and again. And as I said, it, 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 it builds a kind of excitement for the reader um, in and through language itself alongside the plot of what's actually happening. It's beautiful, but thank you. Um, so given what we know about Clarice's life, I think it can be tempting to read this novel, many of her, many of her novels, um, with their biblical allusions, with everything else, as, as being sort of allegorical. Rivka, I'm, I'm curious to know, does that feel useful to you when you're reading her work? Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking as John was reading, um, actually like of this, uh, this moment in the, in, the, in the Bible where the burning bush, who is also God, sort of speaks and has this, uh, speaks oddly and says like, oh, tell them I am sent you in terms of the message. Mm. Like, and, it, and it's an agrammatical or maybe not, I don't know. It's a weird, poor grammar moment yeah. and it kind of delays your cognition and it, it affects the pace with which you move through different spaces in the text. And I almost feel like, I guess, that sort of sensory experience of the Bible, I feel like I experience, that seems closer to me um, than allegory. Not that that's not mm -hmm. present, but I guess like that's the part I connect to or that, um, that I really feel as a as an ex direct experience when reading sure. the book um, as opposed to thinking about it later. Right. Yeah, I mean, there are direct conversations with God in this book. Right? So that's very, that feels very present. Um, that's great. John, I want to just go back to something uh, you alluded to briefly. I'm wondering if you can speak a bit to the quality of her prose in Portuguese and kind of situate her a little bit um, among other Port uh, Brazilian writers in Portuguese. Um, 
kind of in her cohort? So, well, let me just first of all say, I'm no expert in <laughs> Brazilian literature, uh, but I will say this, I believe it in uh, Benjamin Moser's uh, biography of her, you know, he talks about how uh, the people would read her in Portuguese and, uh, you know, sometimes say, well, what is going on? Like right. they wanted, they'd want to correct it, right? Because it was not correct, it, sort of in the proper sense. But but I also think that you know as as Rivka saying you know there is a there's always a method there mm. with her. I mean she knows in terms of using repetition, in terms of using syntax. I mean since she's a, a you know a master of syntax, using syntax to slow you down, to speed you up, to focus your reading. I think it's 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 quite extraordinary. And one of the things I think as I was saying before about the these English translations is that they manage to capture so much of that uh that that richness and strangeness in portuguese right mm -hmm. which is a, a, i think it gives them a kind of charged quality but of course the originals have that have that charged quality and that's one of the reasons i think that people recognize not just in terms of like the overall accomplishment or the you know, brilliant, sheer brilliance of these books but just in terms of the innovativeness the innovation of her portuguese uh, it, it it stands out even today sure that's great um, there's a moment in the book where Martim is kind of struggling over a blank page. And I'm wondering, you know, when you're reading that, does that resonate at all? Is Clarice making a comment about, <laughs> about the struggle of is she equating? I've never with struggled. Have you struggled? I've never. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, she famously said in an interview, I believe, that she, I think she said, you actually use the words, I am marching. Because she was asked, you know, are you Vittoria? Because of course, you know, she's this incredible figure. Yeah. And she said, no, I'm not Vittoria. Uh, I'm probably in some ways more like uh, Ermelinda, mm. you know, the other sister. And of course, it, 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 with the use of the tranquilizers and stuff, I mean, you see that, you know, okay, there, there are aspects, and I feel this is the way, this is the case with all of her books. They're, they're sometimes rather direct aspects drawn from our life, but often, you know, as, as we've said before, things are transmuted. Mm -hmm. But uh, but she also says, I am Marcin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, you know, I am the person who is struggling over the blank page. I am the person who is looking for language. I am the person who is speaking to God and asking these fundamental questions. I am the person who is saying, what does it mean to be human, right? What, what makes me human? How can I make it through this, you know, sort of through the world, through, through the day, through the hour. How can I do this? I feel like that's that's there, that vividness, that mm. that that aliveness exists in her work. And so, yes, I, I think, yeah, that's, that's Clarice <laughs> yeah. tell, speaking to us uh, directly in a way. Well, and to add to the to your description of Marcim, I mean, he's also a guilty man, right, pursued by his guilt. Um, yeah, so that's... I guess that's happening too. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a it's a kind of um, eerie resonance that uh, this book has with Louis Althusser's *The Future Lasts Forever*, where he he has in fact murdered his wife. It's not fiction. He has murdered his wife, and he sort of writes a long book, you know, almost like a backward Dostoevsky to sort of figure out why he did this crime and why it's not his fault and. I just sort of feel like it's a weird mirror on this book and sort of came out not, you know, not too um, far in time. But even though that's a great book with a really amazing title, this is so much more interesting, I guess. I feel like um, as opposed to being a defense, it's an exploration. And I guess that's what to, that's what's more gripping about it mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, that's great. Um, I wanted to ask you to... Reflect, if you can, a bit on this kind of enormous publishing project that's coming at the end of. Um, what does a project like this one do of kind of plucking a, a mid-century a mid -century writer, writer in Portuguese, a uh, language that is not translated very often, um, and kind of doing it in such a robust manner? <laughs> what has this project kind of opened up for, for the two of you? Yeah, I mean, I think not just for me. Um, I think it is one of, um, I mean, this is what I love about about publishing itself, sort of bring something that that 
it's sort of an oral tradition, what books are good and what you should read. And at mm. some point it kind of breaks and it has to be refreshed in some way. And I know, for example, that you know, when I was in college and it's sort of a, it's a little bit of a syllabus book, The Hour of the Star, but nothing else. And no one I knew had ever really read anything by her. But now, um, you know, I, I, I teach writing students and, and, and most of them know about her, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, so I sort of feel like, and that's only because it's sort of been refreshed in the language and refreshed in the, in, in, and the books are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you teach her work? I haven't taught her work. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have taught her work. <laughs> uh, I have to say, I think my students were probably just like, Professor, calm down. <laughs> I was so excited. I taught one, one year, I taught The Passion According to GH. And I was like, I hope and pray these students are as enthralled by this book. And they were. They were. They told me this is one of the most original books they had ever read, mm -hmm. a number of them. Um, I think it's an incredibly important for a publishing house and the world of letters to stick with an author, particularly an author as important as this, and particularly an author from the Global South, from Brazil. I mean, I think Americans, you know, they hear Brazil and they have ideas, certain ideas, right. but to, to see, okay, you know, this, this is like a repository of extraordinary culture. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the really, one of the great writers of the 20th century. Um, so to, to be able to see her work over it, you know, its entire span, um, you know, uh, the, the novels, the short stories, her famous chronicas. I mean, I know people who are writing. I mean, a friend of mine is actually writing chronicas in part based on, you know, reading Clarice's uh, chronicas. Um, I think it's so important, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm really glad that, uh, you know, New Directions got such excellent translators um, because I feel like readers in English um, have really a kind of extraordinary access, direct mm. access now to, uh, to Liz Spector that they wouldn't have um, otherwise if they didn't, you know, uh, re uh, read Portuguese. Right. And maybe now that they've finished, they can start doing it over again with right. a, new, <laughs> a new cohort. Right. Or pick some, pick, right, 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 right. pick some other authors and say, Oh, that too. Yes, right, yeah. Sure, yeah. Clarice, <laughs> along with, yeah. <laughs> This person, that um, person yeah. is Martina out there. Martina, are you in here? Because I do think we have some time for audience questions. Um, so I don't know if we want to pass the mic or how do we want to do this? Any Center for Fiction organizers in the house? <laughs> oh. Okay. All right. Okay. Never mind then. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. I think there's a wine reception afterwards. Yeah. Great. So. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the job. Thank you. Thank you.